Hello and welcome to The Security Show, where we hang out with the most influential experts in security, compliance, and identity. To learn about the challenges they face and the technologies they use to solve them. I'm Natalia Godilla from the Microsoft Security Team and co-host of Security Unlocked. And I'm Nick Fillingham, also from the Microsoft Security Team and also co-host of the Security Unlocked podcast. On with the show. Welcome to the Security Show. Today, we are joined by Chris Wysopel, who is the co-founder and CTO at Veracode. We're going to be doing some puzzles, drinking some coffee, hopefully having a great conversation. Well, Chris, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for your time. Um, could we start with a quick intro for folks that maybe have heard your name but can't quite place the face? Yeah, so my name is Chris Wysopel. I'm the uh, co-founder and chief technology officer at Veracode. Um, started the company 15 years ago. We focus on application security. Um, before that, um, I was a security consultant um, doing pen testing and code reviews. Actually did some of that work for uh, Microsoft as a, as a consultant, helping secure some of the, the flagship applications. Uh, and before I was a consultant, uh, I was a vulnerability researcher um, vulnerability research actually started out of the hacker scene and the computer underground. And um, when I started doing it, it was something that wasn't wasn't quite welcomed by by vendors and government because, you know, no one likes their pants pulled down. And so um, we kind of had to hide the fact that we were doing this from the people that were employing us in our day jobs. I was a programmer. Any of these like m mid to late nineties tech movies, hackers, sneakers, lawnmower man, you were there. Did any of them get it right, or were they all just silly Hollywood hyperbole? And and have you seen anything recently? Do they hold up? Well, I, you know, I think sneakers kind of got it right. Um, you know, at 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 one point, we kind of at back when I was with my hacker crew at the loft back in the late nineties. We were saying, like, maybe this could be a job for us, like doing vulnerability research and doing pen testing. And, and we knew about sneakers and we said, we want to be like the sneakers guys, right? We want a van, we want to roll up, we want someone who's doing like radio surveillance and someone else who's sneaking in. And, you know, we actually saw that as, as you could actually do that as a job. Um, tell us about your pet African gray parrot, please. <laughs> Um, so the interesting thing about him is the, the, the his previous owner was from Maine, and and what you get with when you when you sort of inherit or adopt a parrot is you get all the sounds that they learned from the last place they lived. So you know uh, he he speaks with a little bit of a, a a Maine accent. I think he watched a lot of basketball too because whenever I walk along on the floor, he likes to make that sneaker squeaking on the floor sound. So you just never know what's gonna come out of a parrot's beak. <laughs> what are the biggest threats to software today, biggest vulnerabilities, and are organizations ready for that? When developers use open source libraries and they include them in their products, and then they don't really think about the vulnerabilities that are coming through that open source, um, it, it, it becomes a problem for the entire ecosystem. We saw that with Heartbleed, everyone scrambling around trying to patch their usage of the SSL library. If you're using open source, you really have to think about it differently. You have to think about it as you're managing, you know, something a supplier is delivering to you. But you have to think about, you know, what's what's the bill of materials of my software? What 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 did the supplier drop off to me? And then I have to ma ma make sure that I'm keeping track of vulnerabilities as they come come forward in the future and, and update that. So it, it's, it's kind of like a car manufacturer, that, you know, keeping track of all the parts they use in case there's a defect in, say, airbags and you need to do a recall and replace them. And are there specific tools or... or uh processes to actually to do that, to monitor the open source libraries, the open source code uh, that you're using um, to treat it more like a supply chain and a bill of, bill of materials. If a, if a, 
you know, a, a, a business, an organization is, is sort of adopting open source for the first time? How do they do it safely? Yeah, so there is definitely um, products out there that do it. Um, you know, OWASP has a free tool called Dependency Checker that I know works for Java and some other languages. Um, there are commercial tools. Um, Veracode has one. Um, it's called Software Composition Analysis. And the idea is you can you can run this on your on your on your software either in source form or binary form, and it gives you a list of all the open source you're using, and it detects the version numbers, and then that connects to a vulnerability database, which can then tell you, hey, this version has a vulnerability in it. Um, some of the some of the newer um, capabilities that these tools have is to actually tell you if you're using the part of that open source library that's going to make your application vulnerable. So not every open source library with a vulnerability in it is actually making your app is making your application vulnerable because you might not be using that part. Um, and and so being able to know if you're using the the part that's exploitable is a is is a big help in managing this because. We, we, we find some of our customers, one application is using hundreds of applications, hundreds of libraries. And you just know when you're using hundreds of libraries, there's definitely vulnerabilities in there. It becomes difficult to manage, so you want to you wanna have that information. It, it helps lower the amount of work you're doing to maintain security. So stepping back for a bit, what is modern secure software development? What does it entail? What does it look like? It's, it's interesting because modern secure software development has changed because development practices um, ha ha have changed. Modern software development um, is much more iterative now and much more agile where things aren't planned out in advance. And you have people writing software where they are going from new feature idea to delivering that software in in maybe a week or two or even in days. And so modern uh, software security has had to adapt to that. Um, what you need to do is you need to do things in small chunks and in an iterative way. So that say you're threat modeling just that one new feature at a time, sort of on demand, or you're doing manual penetration testing on just one feature at a time. And your automation has to run at the speed of your of your development pipeline. So that if your development pipeline, you know, building and running your automated tests takes a few minutes, your your, your security testing has to fit into that few minutes too. So this is where um, we're seeing automated tests get faster and faster, but also operate on 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 smaller and smaller chunks and shifted further and further left. So you're not, you're, you're working on the little pieces of the application and it makes it uh, much quicker to get to discovering that vulnerability. So let, let's talk about shifting left. What does shifting left mean and, and how do you do it? Shifting left means that you're really becoming part of the development process. Um, and uh, not even just becoming part of the process, before we deploy the software, let's run all our security all at once right before we deploy it. The problem with both of those is um, you're about ready to deploy your software when you get this big list of things to fix. So obviously that's gonna slow things down. So shifting left is trying to uh, discover the vulnerabilities as close to when those, dis those vulnerabilities are created um, as possible. So you would wanna be doing automated testing you know, on a feature branch as a developer or some developers are working on a feature before it's in that mainline branch when they're deciding, hey, are we, are we done here? Are we done with this feature? Are we going to commit this code? Shifting left would be like, let's do our security testing there um, in, as in, part of the, in part of the pipeline when I'm doing my unit testing. Um, you could even shift further left and scan code in the IDE, um, right as the developer is, is scanning. The, you, there are some limitations that you don't have the full context um, of the application because you might just be looking at you know, one method of code, one class of code. Um, but if you can find a certain percentage of vulnerabilities there, that's, that, that's great. 
The other thing is when we are talking about earlier third party code, um, when you bring an open source library into your application, you want to you want to understand if that version has vulnerabilities right then when you first start using it, or when you're when you're um, when you're when you're building in the pipeline. You don't want to find this after the fact. So lots of different w techniques of of testing software can be shifted left, and even even penetration testing can be shifted left. So I think you just touched on that some of the how elements. So. Uh, how do you actually incorporate security into the process? What tools do you use if you're if a company is trying to transition to this process? What should they be thinking about as like foundational elements? Yeah, so foundational elements for tools um, would be um, things like static analysis, which you know it's it's basically grew out of code review, right? So you can actually inspect all the code just like you would inspect a code by doing a code review, except you're doing it extremely fast and, uh, and, and, and you can look for a huge amount of different coding patterns um, of control flow and data flow and usage of risky functions that, that, that will highlight something that's exploitable. We talked a little bit about software composition analysis, which tells you what open source you're using, but there's a real benefit to doing um, runtime testing, uh, which actually models how the code is, is is running in a particular environment. So codes, so tools like dynamic application security testing, which really focus on um, you know exercising uh, a web interface or an API a, a interface, a RESTful API. Um, there's interactive application security testing, which inspects code as it's running. It's being driven by unit tests or other kind of testing. And, and those types of tests can be built into the, um, the pipeline also and, 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 and tell you things that you might not be able to see um, because they're, 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 they can see how the code is interacting with its environment. So other microservices, other APIs that are outside of your system, the actual you know, container stack it might be running in, that those types of testing can, can see more of uh, how the environment um, is, is affecting the security of the program. Um, so how should companies assign ownership of secure code across the software development lifecycle? This is one that um, I think makes a huge difference and it's assigning the ownership of the security of the code to the people who are writing the code. When you have a finding, whether that was found by an external pen tester, some static analysis tool, it should get routed to the people who own that piece of code. Ideally, they're the ones doing the testing, right? They're running the testing. Um, and so it's close to the time when that code was produced. You know, I see all the time where, you know, you wait till the end um, of a many month project and you find all these vulnerabilities and then you go to fix them and the people who wrote the code um, aren't even on the team anymore. Or I've seen places where they don't want to take up the time for the developers um, that are their prize developers who wrote the code. And they, I've seen even seen people outsource the fixing. So they outsource the fixing. And the problem I see with that is it takes longer to fix. Uh, it might be cheaper actually. Um, but the real downfall of that kind of model is the people who created the vulnerabilities in the first place don't get to learn from that feedback loop. How can somebody who's in maybe the security organization work with that group to raise the level of priority and get that as a, um, get that part of their remit. The way I've seen it work well, and, and this is something we actually do at Faircode, because of course we're a software company, um, is to have a small core, you know, application security team that um, has, a, has a lot of expertise. Maybe a, a ratio of one to a hundred developers um, is something that I've seen work. Um, and, and that team helps each individual scrum team um, get up to speed and ideally um, educates the team with training and uh, even goes above and beyond that and create a security champion um, within that team to try to scale out the, the, the expertise. And they can help out um, 
you know, when there's vulnerabilities found, they can, they can, you know, pair up with a developer that's fixing it. How are you doing on your puzzle? Do we, we need to do a puzzle? Do you want a minute? Yeah, I, I'm not doing so well. I only have some of the edges um, done. It, it doesn't seem like it's that hard of a puzzle. Oh, it's pretty. Uh, I, this mountain has been kicking my butt. Yeah, I'm I, trying. I so yeah. I'm doing the horizon, not the horizon. What do you call it? The the what is this? The coastline. Yeah, part of it is like because the sky and the reflection almost look exactly the same. All right. So uh, next question is, uh, do do you have guidance for someone that's at the very beginning of that journey? I definitely recommend not using C and C plus plus if you can help it. Um, but but let's just say you've picked you know you've picked Node.js or you 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 you've picked Python or, or whatever you, you've you've picked, um, you know educate yourself if if there are um, you know classes and frameworks out there that will help you do things like input validation um, and output encoding and session management um, and um, author author secure authorization secure you know, two factor. And a lot of these might be libraries you're going to be selecting. Uh, the, the other thing that's really important is to, um, you know, build, build in security tooling in, right into your pipeline um, as, as you're building your code. So you're not sort of uh, inadvertently building up all this security debt. Technical debt, security debt is is, 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 is a business decision and, and it can help you get to market faster. But it, it should be something that you, you, you sort of make a conscious decision about, which means get your security tooling um, implemented in your SDLC early um, and, 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 and fix things early. You'll find that they're easy to fix as it becomes part of your process. Um, it really needs to just be part of your normal development process, and then you, you choose to say, well, what's, what's the policy of the risk I'm willing to tolerate in production? What's the risk I'm willing to tolerate putting uh, shipping to my customers? Because you're not going to fix every low severity flaw. For when something does happen, how can companies prepare themselves to detect and respond to anything that, uh, any incidents related to insecure software? You really need to do vendor risk management. Um, you need to think about, um, you know, what what am I using the software for? How 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 risky would vulnerabilities in this software be to my to my business? And then if it's considered something that would be risky, you really need to push back on your vendor and saying, you know, did you build this securely? What kind of encryption are you using? What kind do you have two factor authentication? Will it integrate in with my, my um, single sign-on software? Um, can, can I operate it securely? So there's, there's those basic um, questions about sort of the features that it's being delivered securely. But then I think you need to really get beyond that if it's critical software, say, you know, are your developers background checked? Do you do security testing in your software? What third party libraries are you using that are open source and how do you manage the risks in that? How do you deliver me patches when the next heart bleed um, happens? So uh, it's really a lot of this is, uh, you know, still today questionnaires where you're asking the vendor to talk about their process for creating the software. But I'm starting to see, um, you know, need for evidence of either uh, software testing that you're performing yourself or third party software testing. Um, manual pen tests are very popular for this. So what are some of the more recent innovations in application security that you would love to educate uh, people on? And how can companies up-level their, their tools and processes in this way? So we're starting to see you know, security become code just like infrastructure became code. And it's really truly become part of the, the development process. The cool thing about that is you can clone a, a, a development repo um, and get all of that security testing and configuration as part of your pipeline um, at just, just by cloning, cloning a repo. Um, and so I really think that that's the, that's the future, that security testing just becomes 
you know, a first class part of, of development tooling. The other thing that I've seen that's really cool is just shifting things that are traditionally operational security and vulnerability management to, to, the, to the left. Well, thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today on the show. It's been lovely doing puzzles and hearing about AppSec. Oh, thanks for having me. It's been a great conversation. And uh, I think I'm going to have my 12-year-old son help me finish <laughs> this. <laughs> hey, Jordan. Who's a good bird? Thanks for joining us again on The Security Show. Reach out to us on at MSFT Security on the Twitters or comment below to share your thoughts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel to never miss an episode. See you next time.